Good morning, everybody. Um, let me start with some practicalities. You can speak and listen in French, English, German, Italian, and Spanish. Except, of course, if you speak and listen only to yourself, then you can do it in any language. Um, good morning to all of you. Thank you for being here. Um, my name is Xavier Prasmonet. I'm the Deputy Director General for Education here at the Commission. But formally, uh, meaning when, you, when uh, ESCO was created, uh, I was the Director of Indigenous Employment. So I think, I hope, I am living proof that uh, two different animals, such as the world of education and the world of work, can actually work together, which is, by the way, exactly the point of ESCO. Um, I, I, I should start, really, with a, a word of thanks of, uh, uh, to, to all of you, of course, who are here today, but most importantly, to the people who were at the very origin of ESCO. Uh, as I said, we started with a point where indeed uh, uh, employment with, with uh, Wallace uh, Gulen, who is here with us, uh, we saw, and that was uh, already in 2008 or 2009, we saw that we had a problem. We had a problem with the connectivity of what uh, vacancies uh, were doing with public employment services across Europe. We had a problem also uh, more, more substantially of uh, already a mismatch uh, between what the education and training systems produce and what the labor market needed. So what we did is first create a group of experts from, uh, experts from outside the EU to try to help us get a better grasp of what should be done. And that group of experts were, uh, we had Marcus from uh, the German Public Employment Service, we had Mike Campbell who is uh, also here today with us, where we had a few ideas and one clear idea was the need for, well, ESCO. And Therefore, we started, I think, back in October 2010 with the first meeting of stakeholders of ESCO. And today, I'm extraordinarily happy to have the honor of saying a few words to welcome ESCO alive, come alive, or ESCO going live. Now, at the time, as I said, we had this sense that there was a challenge, that there was an issue in mismatches between uh, uh, labor markets uh, and between education and training systems. Well, what we didn't know at that time is how extraordinarily important that challenge would be. Uh, so let me start just with just a, a couple of reminders to actually most of you who don't need these reminders, a couple of reminders about how deeply labor markets have changed. And they have changed actually, they started changing uh, in the 1990s when all of a sudden, just because the former Soviet Union, China, India, decided to join the world economy and world trade, the global labor force in the world doubled from one and a half billion to three billion. That moment, we're still living the consequences today, and there will be a lot to say as to the implications of that, for example, for the lowering place and lowering role of salaries in overall GDP, and for the turmoil we are seeing in uh, labor markets and indeed in the global distribution of talent across the world. So we had really extraordinary transformations due to globalization in labor markets, and we come now to a situation with this crisis where we have at the same time a pretty high average unemployment rate in the EU, almost 11%, and twice as many young people unemployed, with some countries like, unfortunately, my own, uh, Spain, having twice as much a uh, rate. And yet, at the same time, to prove the case of the challenge of vacancies, at the same time as we have this challenge of unemployment, we have over two million <laughs> vacancies that cannot be filled on a permanent basis in Europe. So, a clear case of mismatch. And then, if we look at the skills for the future, what uh, uh, skills labor market will need? Well, of course, the first thing to say is we have very little idea of what will be those skills. We know labor markets will change dramatically. We don't know exactly how, but we do know that there will be an increased need for high-level skills, people, a slight decrease of mid-level skills, and a steep decrease of low-level skills jobs. So this is again a reminder, if we're going to have, as our forecasts say by 2025, that we're going to have about 45% of jobs in the high skill sector, 45% in the mid-skill, mid-range, and 10, 11% at low skill jobs. This is again a big reminder that we need to make a big effort in Europe to upgrade the skills of people. 
And even in the shorter term, where we can have a far better idea, especially in some sectors that are more easily quantified, we do see immediately, already now, a big challenge in terms of unfilled vacancies. And the ICT sector is the most striking case where we have a forecast of 900,000 vacancies uh, in the digital skills gap, 900,000 vacancies unfilled in Europe by 2015. And there is no way to understate the importance, to overstate the importance of this for productivity and growth. Right, so indeed, indeed, deep changes, long term and shorter term changes in labor markets, but indeed also extraordinary changes in the world of education. Um, you know that uh, we have uh, uh, recently had the PIAC survey. PIAC survey is the PISA, the OECD survey, PISA for everybody else. So an assessment of the skills, numeracy and uh, literacy skills of people, adults across several countries, 17 of those in the European Union, well, the picture there is pretty, pretty striking. For example, 20% of adults in Europe, 20% of adults in Europe don't have even the most basic of literacy and numeracy skills. Now, 20% is a striking figure, but then you have also a far, perhaps more, a far stronger indication of the challenge we have in terms of mismatch and adaptation of what the education system produces to the labor market needs in the exceptional distance that the PIAC survey shows between qualifications and actual competencies. You look at, I mean, let me tell you the most striking, striking finding of the PIAC survey, which we have analyzed closely in RDG uh, together with the OECD. It's a pretty simple thing. We have now a couple of countries in Europe, for example, Spain and Italy, where the average skills of a university graduate are lower, are lower than the average skills of a secondary education graduate in Finland, Denmark, Sweden, the Netherlands, for example. Now, this is really quite strong as a statement because it forces us to look very closely at the link between qualifications and skills at measuring education outcomes and most importantly, at actually looking at improving the skills of people and the outcome of education and training systems, as opposed to looking exclusively at qualifications. So we have, in the world of education, also considerable challenges, and indeed, what I think uh, one should not hesitate to call a tsunami in the field of education because of the combination between ICTs, data analytics, and globalization. The education systems of Europe and the world have been so far remarkably immune to the shock that other sectors of the economy have felt precisely because of technology and globalization. The banking sector, the music sector, the media. Well, this time it's different. And we see very clearly that the changes in supply of education, the changes of demand in education, and the changes in the way people teach and learn that are facilitated by technology will be really a sea change in the short term in our education and training systems. So, to make a long story short, this is just to stress how significant the changes that we see both in education and employment are, and therefore how important it is to find, well, a bridge between education and employment, and ESCO is that, a bridge between education and training on the one hand, and jobs on the other. You know, I think it was Khrushchev who once said that uh, the business of politics is about building bridges where there is no river. Uh, this, is a, this is a very good example of a really huge river that is actually expanding and the need to build a bridge across it. And this is what we have tried with you to do for the last three years. And this is what we are putting today online. So, there is indeed, in the evidence we see over the last few years, a compelling necessity to collect timely information about demand and supply of skills, to provide quality career guidance, and to ensure that qualifications are coherent and easy to interpret. This is what all member states will have to do, this is what institutions and individuals will have to do, and this is what ESCO can try to help doing. This is the raison d'etre of ESCO. This is why we are having uh, ESCO. We have, of course, other tools. For example, another, I think, 
exceptional example of cooperation within the Commission and hopefully in the Member States between education and work is the European Alliance for Apprenticeships where in a critical area such as work-based learning therefore another aspect of joining education and work in that critical area we have put together the efforts of education ministries employment ministries and indeed public employment services across the EU to make sure that we provide better service in there and of course we have prepared the new programs for education and training in RDG precisely to give the instruments to address the kind of challenges that I just described. We have the European Qualifications Framework, we have the EU Skills Panorama launched last December, again as other tools to try to give us a better view in the fog that is the assessment of uh, future uh, skills needs, just as the Europass CV provides a European template for the description of skills, competencies and achievements. Right, so this is, this is indeed part of a broader spectrum, but ESCO has a specific role and fits extremely well into what we see are uh, the future needs. Introducing a multilingual European classification of occupation, skills, competencies and qualifications is indeed what we believe is the best way for Europe to help education and training systems and labour markets to better identify and manage the availability of required skills, competencies and qualifications. It has, as you know, a multilingual character. We have 22 languages and we will have 25 by next year. And this, we hope, will facilitate increased international transparency and cooperation. Um, ESCO can actually, hopefully, has an exceptional potential from several perspectives. And let me just point out what ESCO can do precisely from the perspective of different actors. From the point of view, first and foremost, of job seekers, job seekers can use ESCO to describe their skills, competencies and qualifications when developing their own CV, which can then go through various automated matching processes. They can also compare their skills, competencies and qualifications against job vacancies using ESCO terminology to identify the skills that they are lacking. Employers can use ESCO to define the set of skills, competencies and qualifications that they require when they are developing a job description. Learners, whether they are already employed or not, can use it to record the formal and informal learning outcomes and build personal skills and competencies profiles. And this particular area, if we believe in the impact of technology in education, then there's no uh, way to understate the importance of providing a way to certify and to record skills that have been acquired outside the formal education system. Workers can use the ESCO occupational profiles to help identify the skills gaps against their own target occupations. Of course, education and training institutions can use uh, ESCO in their curriculum development and assessment to make sure that their graduates are more relevant to uh, uh, employment. And then other organizations which are developing and uh, uh, awarding qualifications can use ESCO to express the learning outcomes of their qualifications to refine emerging skills needs and to facilitate the understanding of their qualifications across borders. Human resource managers and people offering career guidance can use ESCO to enhance planning and make aptitude tests. And last but not least, employment services can use ESCO to exchange relevant labour market information, CVs, vacancies, in a, in a meaningful uh, and transparent way. So this has to a focus on who, who, who could be the users of ESCO, but ESCO has more, some more general assets that potentially can also be exploited. Very simply, it will develop more generally uh, the exercise of online and skills-based job matching. It should allow actors in the labour market and in education to exchange information on job vacancies and curricula despite language barriers or national systems. It should help education institutions and employment services and their staff and in the shift, sorry, towards a skills and competence oriented approach, something we always repeat but 
perhaps we're not there yet, and it will contribute to a better understanding of qualifications by the labour market to make recognition across borders easier and allow to a more accurate skills-based job matching. So this, just as an example of what ESCO can provide. It can facilitate geographical and occupational mobility across Europe and ultimately contribute modestly but significantly to getting more people into the right jobs throughout Europe. This, however, of course, will, is a fantastic idea. These are very good intentions, but it will never work if we don't manage to make sure that ESCO is known and used. And this is indeed the critical moment, and this is where we are very conscious at the Commission that we need you. We need the stakeholders that are potential users of EXCO to help us inform and to help us commit. To help us inform by helping us make sure that you speak about ESCO and explain to our colleagues, to your colleagues, what it is and what it can potentially do, and help us commit by using ESCO in the existing applications that you have and develop new ones, for example, for competence-based job matching and skills audits or, for example, for e-guidance. And, of course, we need you to initiate the implementation of ESCO in your country and to help us, of course, improve and develop ESCO. Because for us, for us, ESCO is just the beginning. It has taken a long time to make it live, but we see that this is a potentially permanent instrument where with the right feedback and with the right changes over the next years we will make it an ever more useful uh, tool. Um, we also think, we also would encourage you to participate in one of the reference groups uh, that we still have to set up. I think we have still 16 of those uh, on top of the 11 we have to set up. So indeed, uh, hopefully the conference will help you understand what ESCO is, and even more, hopefully on our side, it will help you be even more convinced that ESCO is an interesting uh, tool. You will see today presented the portal where you can browse through ESCO, leave your suggestions for improvement, and perhaps more importantly, where you can download it for free uh, to use in applications such as, job, such as for job matching. Today we'll also discuss where ESCO takes its place more generally in EU policies and how it facilitates skill-based job matching. And tomorrow we will explain how we will come to the next version of ESCO and we will show some future application possibilities as an illustration. But again, we have also created time for you. This we believe since many of you have come from different countries, we believe that this is, we should also offer this conference, this seminar, as an opportunity for you to discuss with the representatives of your countries so to see how ESCO can be used by you and for you and what is needed to implement ESCO in your own national context. So we believe that this conference will be the beginning of a fruitful exchange and conversation between the Commission and the people and institutions it is supposed to serve. Right, this should be all, but then of course there's a little bit more than this because I really don't think that I can stop speaking, and I know I've been really very too long, without saying a few words about the many people who, not just because it was a job, but because they believe in it, did so many things to make ESCO happen in practice. And I would really like to pay tribute, personally, for whatever that is modestly worth, but also on behalf of the Commission, to the people within our house and of course outside who have made ESCO possible so far and who will keep it alive. Before I do that more specifically, I would like to now please give the floor to uh, Martin Watson who has some extraordinary announcement to make, I believe. <laughs>